small farmers don't have a lot of pocket change, you know? There's just not a lot in the bank. We have a lot of wherewithal and a lot of drive, but not necessarily a lot of money to work with. We looked at buying a 40-acre piece of land, 8,000 an acre, all said and done. If we wanted to grow something like vegetables, it would cost us one and a quarter million dollars. To, so yeah, all the land that we farm, we rent. I'm Adam Gaska. I uh, own and co-operate uh, Mendocino Organics with my partner Paula. We're a diverse uh, organic biodynamic farm, providing food for the our local community in the Bay Area. I'm Erica Helen. I'm from Oklahoma. I'm Joel Slezak, and I'm from Free Union, Virginia. Uh, we are a grass farm. We're called Free Union Grass Farm. And we raise pastured poultry, chicken and duck, 100% grass-fed beef, and super free-range eggs. We are using this land. We got uh, offered it by a uh, local food organization. We work 40 hours a month for the landowner to work in exchange for rent and at least the implication was to have some level of authority on that farm, this farm. Even if you give us free land, there's so many strings attached. There are some games that you just have to play and there's hoops you have to jump through. And I think in monoculture, I guess like a big commodity is always gonna exist. You have more and more centralization and just focusing toward one crop. People that are farming a thousand acres or two thousand acres, doing most things with machines, um, farming ten acres isn't going to be worth it. And I think it's going to continue to be like that to where these medium-sized people are basically going to abandon their land or whatever, or stop farming it. Um, I mean, for people like us, it's great because then there's you know land to lease or whatever, because that is more of an appropriate size for what we're doing. I think that uh, you got to have to be creative with the land use and what land you have. You're not going to get, you know, the perfect 500 acre farm, first time bad or, you know, ever. The idea too is we have kind of a trial, 15 acres, um, and if we can do a good job really improving it and making it look beautiful, maybe they'll give us the other 500. <laughs> so. <laughs> it seems like a critical mass that once we lease our first piece of land, and people see that we can actually farm it. More people are offering us land. So now we're, we just looked at number six the other day, six parcel, um, but we'll be at about 110 acres. And then, you know, right now we're employing, uh, besides Paul and I, uh, one and a half more employees, so. They we're able to raise our product and make money, and we're also able to hopefully improve the land that we're on, so it's kind of win-win. You know, we can do it for free because it's beneficial to the property owner because we're really beautifying and, and, and uh, improving the soil. We just moved the, the, the chicks one space, which is 12 feet. And then what remains is uh, a fresh patch of manure. They ate a lot of weeds, they ate the bugs in midsummer, and uh, the wren will wash this in and uh, really promote some uh, good growth. So. Uh, this is uh, why we do it. We uh, graze sheep in the vineyard during the dormant season. That's basically one of the main reasons why I came here, or that the landlord wanted me to be here. In about March, once the cover crop's grown up enough, we put them out in the vineyard, and it works out so that they munch it all down within about one week. So it kind of saves them one tractor pass, is pretty much what it does. There's always on that country store back there on the porch, do you see the second one? There's always like three or four old guys sitting on the, on the benches. If you're in a F-250, if you're in a truck, they always wave, all three of them will wave. <laughs> I've never gotten a wave in this car <laughs> or gotten a wave in my Volvo. But as soon as you get in that truck, you get all waves. <laughs> I think for other you know, young, new beginning farmers, um, but it's still trying to figure out the uh, sort of social logistics of that. 
trying to find equitable arrangements so the landowner feels like they're getting something out of it, um, but it's also fair for the person farming there. Uh, secretly, I kind of think that we, you know, we got signed on to just be kind of glorified dog sitters, but because we don't really have anything to do with the organic process at this point besides the chickens. It's complicated when you're, when you're when you're younger than they are and when you're indebted to them in a way because you're living on their property, you're living in a house that they own, that they built, and you know the equipment and the tools that you're using are theirs. I mean, you feel like you can only say so much. Our understanding was that all activity here was moving towards as organic as possible, and I think honestly we were really misled. We've not been given any authority to actually operate the way we anticipated and the way we, we have to for our own business. It just turns out that that existing farm manager has no knowledge or interest, or interest to be per persuaded to do things differently. I had seen him up on the adjacent field calibrating his machinery. So I asked him and I said, you know, what are you going to be spraying up there? And he said, well, I'll be spraying Grazon and Grazon is a really toxic herbicide, and any breeze that stirs from where they're spraying will certainly come over and make contact with our animals. You know, this is our livelihood. These are our animals. The misinformation is just unacceptable. It's just stupid, so. That was my morning. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think uh, we drive 25 minutes one direction, the farthest place we lease. It's probably one of the hardest things, just because once you, you know, load up all the tools in the truck, if you forget one thing, you're screwed. Not to mention gas. I mean, gas is close to $5, so then, I mean, that one mistake or whatever, it could just cost you 5 or $10 in driving. And it's just a lot of work and stressful, not knowing what's going on at that farm. You can't see the cows or hear the chickens or something's going on. But uh, using lots of small properties might be something that we might have to deal with forever. So figuring out how to automate that and make that sustainable is definitely a challenge. When you're talking about a, a, you know, a functioning democracy and Jefferson's ideal, you're talking about uh, a lot of small landowners, you know, everyone needs a patch of land and everyone needs to be able to farm it, you know, if they so choose. And w w when you do that, it gives everyone an unbelievable amount of freedom and, and liberty and, and strength to, you know, be in charge of their life. A lot of the places that we farmed were either underutilized or in some cases you know, virtually abandoned. Which is good for our local community economy too, you know, is that we're starting to actually make these places create wealth for the community. I mean, it's one thing to be socially aware and feel socially responsible and operate in a way that benefits all of those around you. You have to be able to support yourself and you have to have the knowledge and the tools and the education to be able to do that. So yeah, this is a lot of work. I think the challenges are more than we ever imagined. But I think it comes with time and experience and age, and as we grow older and people trust us more, we can, you know, make it happen, so.